No problem. Okay, folks, so it's about 7.01. We're going to wait just another minute or so for folks to keep on coming in. Um, they're still attend, people are still arriving, and then we will get the evening started. Oh, okay, well, it looks like we have a, a good crowd here, so I'm going to go ahead and get started. Um, good evening, everyone. My name is Nancy McComb, and I thank you for joining us tonight. Uh, I'm a librarian here at the Chelmsford Library. And before we really get started, I just want to highlight a few upcoming programs. So the first I'll mention is that the Chelmsford Art Society is having a fine art demonstration by Bethany Peck tomorrow night, uh, 7 p.m. at the Chelmsford Center for the Arts. Uh, Bethany Peck is a tremendously accomplished painter with a large following. She writes, in my paint, quote, in my paintings, I evoke emotion through natural elements of heaven, earth, and water in an expressionistic manner. I create imaginary worlds that I call, quote, unquote, dreamscapes. Uh, the CCA live streams the will live stream the demonstration on YouTube, and they can also welcome a small number of vaccinated attendees. Uh, a wonderful painter herself, this this event will be facilitated by artist uh, Barbara Ludinsky. Uh, for those who may not know, the Chelmsford Art Society welcomes artists and lovers of art in Chelmsford and surrounding communities. There are over 70 active members from the very experienced to those who are just starting out. They have artist demonstrations in September through May and winter and summer shows at the library and a big 4th of July festival. They also offer a scholarship to students going on to a degree in the arts. All right, so then moving on to uh, some library events on Wednesday, February 23 at 7 p.m., uh, excuse me, yeah, when the Chelmsford Art Society has Bethany Puck, excuse me, on Thursday, February 24th, you can join us at the library for a very special event featuring the author Zora Neale Hurston. She will share her experience and talk about her research into African-American storytelling. On Wednesday, March 2 at 7 p.m., Jeff Klapes, the traveling librarian, returns from a trip to Thailand. On Thursday, March 3, the Museum of Bad Art returns with a presentation called Doppelhangers, featuring pieces of, of their collection that, intentionally or unintentionally, resemble famous people or works of art. Then later on in March, Jane O'Neill will be back with us online for a new presentation on Georgia O'Keeffe, and that will be Tuesday, March 29 at 7 p.m. For information about all of our events, please sign up for our newsletter at chelmsfordlibrary.org. And many thanks to the Friends of the Chelmsford Library whose fundraising efforts support our programming. Please consider joining or donating to keep our programs going. All right. So tonight's talk, in tonight's talk, Jane O'Neill will be uh, speaking about uh, 
Quilts, Paintings, and Politics, the, the, the Quilts, Paintings, and Politics of Faith Ringgold. For those of you tuning into these talks for the first time, our presenter, Jane O'Neill, who has been presenting art talks online for us for about two years now, holds a master's in art history from Boston University and a master's in education from the Harvard University Graduate School of Education. She is a New Hampshire native and has worked at some of the state's most esteemed cultural institutions, including the League of New Hampshire Craftsmen, where she served as executive director, and the Courier Museum of Art, where she held the role of senior educator. Jane founded the Courier's Alzheimer's Cafe and led the tour program for the museum and the Frank Lloyd Wright designed Zimmerman House. She has taught art history at the college level for more than a decade, most recently at the New Hampshire Institute of Art. Her nonprofit, Culturally Curious, has a mission to engage, educate, and unify groups through facilitated art, arts experiences that inspire joy and foster critical and creative thinking, as well as an appreciation for our shared humanity. Tonight, she will talk about the artist Faith Ringgold, who is celebrated for an artistic career exploring race in the American experience. She will cover the breadth of her creative output, including paintings, sculpture, performance art, and her beloved story quilts. Uh, I should also note that this presentation uh, is a collaboration with other public libraries in Andover, Bill Ricca, and North Reading. Uh, please send any questions that you have to the chat and Jan Jane will answer them at the end. And thank you so much, Jane. We really welcome you here. It's my pleasure. Thank you so much for having me back. Thank you, Nancy, and to all the other hosting libraries tonight. And to everybody who has taken time out of their day to learn a little bit more about Faith Ringgold, who I can tell you is now definitely one of my favorite artists after um, doing the research and putting together this program. So it's an absolute pleasure for me tonight to share a little bit more about her life and her work. She is of course, an American artist and an author. She's best known for her story quilts and for the expression of her political beliefs in, um, in her paintings. So on the screen, we have one of her quilts. It's a uh, dedicated to one of her childhood friends, a man by the name of Sonny Rollins, who grew up to be a preeminent jazz saxophonist. So what an incredible way to celebrate him and his talent. And I think the visuals tonight and, um, and the stories behind them will really knock your socks off. So let's get started looking at how we're going to spend the next hour together. And as always, if you have questions or comments along the way, please put them in the chat or the Q&A and we'll go through everything together at the end. So here we are looking at the artist Faith Ringgold. She is 91 years young and I just absolutely love this photograph of her. It, it feels like a great introduction to her. So we're going to get started on her personal story uh, sort of right up to the launch of her artistic career. And then we'll be looking at, we'll be starting off with her paintings and how they engage with politics, specifically racism and sexism. Then we'll turn our attention to quilts and, and storytelling essentially. Uh, and one particular collection of quilts, we won't even have time to look at all of them in that collection, but just giving you a sense in terms of what I think of as like her, her uh, magnum opus in terms of her work. And then we will wrap up with what she's been doing more recently and sort of where things stand with you know quilt making and storytelling and politics in general all right there's as always a lot to cover tonight so i'm going to try and talk quickly okay so let's get started with faith ringgold as as a, as a young person she was born in harlem in 1930 and grew up in harlem here we can see her as a baby in a carriage and here we see her over here the youngest of three siblings um she is incidentally where they are all incidentally wearing coats that were designed by faith ringgold's mother and i should mention she was born faith jones so here is um is, is her mother and her father in the central picture here. Her mother was actually a fashion designer. And this over here on the left is Faith Ringgold's grandmother, her maternal grandmother. And if you have really good eyes, you can see her, her maternal grandmother is standing in front of her sign that says dressmaking over here. So incidentally, Faith Ringgold comes from generations of women who have um, experience and talent working with fabric. So it's probably Probably not a surprise that she ends up working in a similar, the same medium, really. So she's growing up in Harlem, but she never talked about her childhood in the 1930s as feeling poor or feeling oppressed. She here she is walking down the street with her mother, um, but she talked about uh, growing up around the corner from 
Ella Fitzgerald and Duke Ellington and, um, and having this kind of incredible creativity around her that she almost began to think of as, as normal. And this is also around the time where, um, where the, the Harlem Renaissance is still kind of buzzing. So there's, you know, black intellectuals and black creatives everywhere. And they sort of set the standard in terms of um, what was possible for young black people in this neighborhood at this time. So, so Faith Ringgold is uh, sort of opened up to a world of possibilities, even at a young age. So she is a well-educated woman. We see her over here in her high school graduation photo. This is her um, graduation photo from college. She had gone to study art. And, um, and once she got to the City College of New York, she um, she was essentially told that that was a major that only men could major in. So she studied art education and then went on to teach in New York City public schools and then went back and got um, got an advanced degree. And we see her uh, her graduation photo over here on the far right. So um, clearly someone who's, who's very determined, who can, who can juggle uh, working life and education. And these are her two children in the midst of, of attaining all of all of these degrees, Faith Ringgold got married and started a family. And so here we see her with her first husband, a uh, man by the name of Robert, Robert Earl Wallace. He was a jazz pianist. They were married in 1950 and um, pretty quickly had two daughters, Michelle and Barbara, but they separated about five years later. And, um, and that was probably due to uh, uh, his heroin addiction, which would later kill him. So Faith Ringgold was, uh, you know, working and bringing up two girls and by the photos, it really makes it seem as though she's doing this very well. Uh, it seems as though it, it was sort of a matriarchal family. She spent a lot of time with her mother over here. Here she is with her daughters uh, who look like they're going off to uh, a dance recital. And here on the right, they are headed off to Paris together on, on I believe it was the SS Liberté in 1961. So Faith Ringgold is living a pretty comfortable life still in Harlem in a nice neighborhood, nice neighborhood called Sugar Hill. We see her over here in this lovely dress on the right. She's actually serving as a model for one of her mother's many fashion shows. And she talked about how um, at one of these shows, her, her mother kind of uh, thrust the microphone on her and asked her to MC. And Faith Ringgold really wasn't comfortable talking at this point, but, uh, but her mother gave her a few pointers and then sort of sashayed away. And Faith Ringgold found her voice, she found her confidence. And, um, and it was through these fashion shows that she became really comfortable uh, speaking in front of a group. So during the uh, early 1960s, her life gets um, a sort of an added layer of stability to it. She gets remarried to a, a man named Burdette Ringgold in 1962. Here's her wedding photo and um, a moment at the wedding with her daughters. And, uh, and so Burdett, Burdett, he's known as Birdie, he provides, um, he begins to provide for this family. And at that point, Faith Ringgold can really dedicate herself to becoming an artist. She transforms their dining room and she gets to work. So she's no longer teaching in, um, in New York City public schools. And incidentally, Burdett Ringgold or Birdie uh, is sort of a major factor, I would say, in her career. Uh, they are married for uh, about the next 58 years, Burdett Ringgold just died in 2020 and we can see that sometimes he makes an appearance in her in her art here they are with their arms around each other flying through the air here's a, a portrait of him in quilt form and he's standing next to it so these really kind of loving traditions over the years and uh and it gives us a sense that that it was a, a great partnership and we do know that Burdette or Birdie uh, supported her in that she really liked to show her her work to gallerists in New York City and show it in person. I mean, this was going back to before you could simply email somebody uh, an image. So he would help her kind of haul these big canvases around. Um, so right off the bat, he's, he's made himself very useful. So we'll wrap up this introduction to the artist with these two very different 
portraits. Uh, the one on the left is from 1959, and the one on the right is from just six years later. And we can see that there's been a radical transformation in her work. She sort of found her personal style here. And she has a great story as to why and how that happened. It was one of these instances where she was going to a gallery to show her work. And she had been working in this kind of traditional um, style that she often likened to like the European masters, the old masters. That was what she was taught when she was in college and in graduate school. So she shows her work to a gallerist who was named um, ironically Ruth White. And Ruth White apparently looked at the work and looked at Ruth Wing Ringgold and said, you cannot paint like this. And for whatever that really meant, whether it was like, you need to paint something about your people or maybe you're not allowed to paint like this, Faith Ringgold took this as, um, as this moment to feel totally free and totally empowered and to uh, begin portraying subjects uh, that mattered to her in a style that was all her own. So she kind of gives up on, on emulating the European masters and she really begins to do something that's visionary and, 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 um, and through and through singular in terms of her vision. So let's turn our attention to her paintings beginning in the early 1960s. Now, so much of her work from this time is uh, geared towards issues of racism and sexism and social justice. And I think she does this in such a moving and brilliant way. And I hope that within the, the space of the next few minutes, you're, you're going to be as deeply moved as I have been learning about her. So. Um, so let's start off with this work from 1962. This is called They Speak No Evil. Now, in the 1960s, we have Faith Ringgold creating these kind of bold and provocative images. A lot of them are in response to the civil rights movement, these feminist movements. Um, but basically, what she begins to do is really a, an unprecedented exploration of race and gender in America. And she does something that I think is very similar to um, our experience when we read a book. Uh, when you really connect with a character in a novel, for instance, there's this perspective taking that's really profound. You see the world through that character's eyes. And in the art world, generally speaking, um, it's assumed that, that you look at art through the, or art is created for the eyes of a white man. There's this notion of the, the white male gaze. Um, so Faith Ringgold throws that throws that that paradigm away, and she creates artwork that is essentially sharing her perspective, sharing the the gaze essentially of a black woman. And we see what we take her on her perspective, and we see what the world looks like through her eyes. And the result is really powerful. We have this wall of these six men. They have these tiny little um, bodies here, but these huge heads, these kind of mask like faces. And um, and of course we we read them as being white men because these they have you know this roughly blonde uh, blonde hair here and they have these these kind of hollow vacant eyes here so we get this sense that that there's something they're kind of an impenetrable force here and they're kind of um, purposely not understanding who we are. We don't get any sort of sense of recognition or empathy when we deal with them. Now, I do want to say that, um, that this mode of expression was inspired at least in part by Picasso and Cubism from the early part of the 20th century. So over here, I have Picasso's famous Demoiselle d'Avignon from 1907. And this is his, his famous work where he begins to integrate um, um, the influence of African masks into his paintings. And in this case, we're looking at these five nude women and the masks here were meant to render them sort of terrifying. This is a brothel setting after all. And so uh, once again, Faith Ringgold is flipping the script. And instead of making African masks, uh, uh, transforming women into something that's terrifying, she's using this mask notion um, and a little bit of the Picasso's stylings here, but she's using that mask notion to make 
white people, indifferent white people, uncaring or even um, hate-filled white people as, as being equally terrifying. So let's turn our attention to her series called the American People series that begins the following year in um, 1963. Now, this is a really pivotal year in American history. It's the 100th anniversary of the Emancipation Proclamation. It's the year that Edgar Mever Medgar Evers, the civil rights leader, was assassinated. J JFK um, was also assassinated. And Martin Luther King Jr. makes his I Have a Dream speech. So there's a lot happening in the world. And so Faith Ringgold begins this series of 20 works that sort of speak to Black-white dynamics in America. This work is called Neighbors from 1963. And once again, she's asking us to take on her perspective, the perspective of a Black American. So what do your neighbors, what do your white neighbors think of you um, when you're, you're moving into your house or coming home? Well, they're certainly not very friendly, are they? <laughs> they have, um, they, they, well, first of all, we get this very notion of being stared at, as of, of being something that is a spectacle, be, feeling like you're out of place somewhere. And we have um, these kind of, once again, these sort of hollowed out eyes, the sense of, of resignation, uh, this older woman with the piercing stare here, and then, you know, the solemn yet curious expression of, of the child here. This is, uh, this is profoundly uh, disturbing to be looked at this way. Way. And, and Faith Ringgold is forcing all of us to experience it. This next work here is called For Members Only. It's also a part of this series. Um, and we have, once again, this wall of, of, of these tiny bodies with these big heads, these men with distorted mask-like faces. They're somber, they're sort of maudlin, um, but there is this incredible use of color here. I really love how she's integrated these blue shadows into their faces and into their eyes. And so you can see, even in the space of one year, I feel like her painting has become so much more sort of nuanced and sophisticated here. And of course, the, this notion of for members only really is once again implying that, that you are not welcome, you are not allowed here. It uh, reminds me of the phrase for whites only. And it's a reminder that this painting was created when segregation was still legal. So, so she's tapping into um, a lot of really important ideas here. This next work is one that's often really celebrated as part of this series, and it's called Mr. Charlie from 1964. And what we're looking at here is, of course, um, you know, these bold colors and um, this really sort of wonderful style that she's developed here. I, I love the geometries in the background, but in this case, this figure is really overwhelming the picture plane. He's not even contained by his head and his body um, uh, expand beyond the frame of this picture. So it seems like he's in our space. He's pressed right up against the surface of this canvas here. And he seems to almost be looking out at us, but he's got this un focused gaze. And then beyond that, he's got this gesture of the hand on his chest. It's almost as though he's speaking from his heart, but because his hand's not even on his heart, there's something disingenuous about it. So it's this notion of, um, of interacting with people who have traditionally been in power, who are once again, not seeing you, not really seeing who you are and not engaging with you with, with your true humanity. I mean, there's, it's, um, it's somebody who's kind of going through the motions here. And this name, Mr. Charlie, was one um, that was used in African-American communities as, as a way to describe a racist white man. And so Mr. Charlie um, rears, his, uh, his, rears up again in this series, sort of at the top of this stack of individuals in a picture called The In Crowd from 1967. Um, and we see a, a group of very well-dressed men. You can almost imagine this is like a corporate por portrait in some ways. But as, as we look further down the stack, the, um, the gestures get more and more aggressive. Mr. Charlie is just kind of resting his hands on people. We go further down and it seems as though they're pushing people down. They're silencing other people. And of course, uh, in particular, silencing this black man sort of at the bottom of this pyramid here. So we have these, um, these cold, empty stares from, from these individuals. There's, um, the, these works are, are pretty challenging, very tough to look at. Uh, Faith Ringgold called this style super realism because 
because she wanted her audience to really make a connection with the imagery and the messages here. But she was actually told at one point that these steely eyed white faces were just going too damn far. Uh, notice too how she's created the, the red arrows here pointing downward. There's this sense of pressure and oppression that goes along with this. Um, this next work is called uh, a Portrait of an American Youth from 1964. It's part of the American People series. And so we just see uh, a well-dressed young Black man, or perhaps even a boy. It's hard to tell exactly how old he might be. But we we see that he, um, he has all the potential in the world, right? And but we see these strange symbols behind him that sort of suggest what might um, what might hamper his progress and his success. We see the silhouette of a white figure behind him, like a white man. This could be another Mr. Charlie here. And we see all of these arrows pointing down into the side. Faith Ringgold talked about this figure as as having all the promise in the world, um, but if, if he can sort of um, get by or withstand the onslaught of racism, prejudice, pre prejudice that he would have to face, and he would manage to survive. And it was said that this portrait in particular was inspired by something that happened to Faith Ringgold's own older brother. When he, um, Andrew, was a teenager, he was uh, the victim of a uh, racially inspired attack. And, um, and it, was, uh, it was absolutely brutal. And it was one that took place with the police uh, uh, watching, they they were in full knowledge of what was happening, and they didn't um, they they didn't interrupt it on her brother's behalf. When he made it home, Faith Ringgold was there, and she could see her brother's skull. Her mother immediately tried to take her brother to a hospital, and they wouldn't take care of him because he was black. So she had a profoundly upsetting experience uh, related to um, race and and uh, and violence at this young age. And and to her, this picture sort of embodied what could have happened to her brother, uh, or who her brother could have been. Unfortunately, um, because of that attack, he he um, later became a, a drug addict and. And he died um, just a few years before this picture was made in 1964. So to sort of round out this, this collection or these types of works, I'm going to show you actually, this is the first work that she made in the series. It's from 1963 and it's called Between Friends. How would you gauge this interaction between this white woman and this woman of color? There's, um, there's this barrier sort of in between them. Maybe it's a window frame, maybe it's a door frame. Um, but but how how do they understand each other? Is there empathy here? Well, this work was inspired by um, Ringgold's own experiences. She was living for the summer on Martha's Vineyard with a friend who had um, a, di a diverse friend group, essentially. Um, a lot of white women and a lot of women in co of color, and they'd get together and play cards once a week. And Faith Ringgold talked about the white women sort of showing up to sort of represent their husbands, their husbands' business interests. But there was this kind of um, unspoken barrier between them. There wasn't like a real connection that existed between these women. And she managed to capture that in this first early work. And just to give you a sense of the scale here too, this is a photograph of the artist from 2013, standing next to the painting. So you can just imagine Faith Ringgold and her husband sort of lugging these paintings around New York City. All right, so there's a, a few last pictures from uh, related to this series that are really different and uh, incredibly powerful to me. So this is a picture that's called um, the US, U.S. Postage Commemorating the Advent of Black Power from 1964. Now, spoiler alert, <laughs> there was no postage stamp ad, uh, um, commemorating the advent of Black Power. <laughs> this was certainly something that the postage, uh, uh, that uh, the post office wasn't going to take on at this time. And so this work that we're looking at, just to give you a sense of the scale here, is not the size of a postage stamp. It's, you know, big enough to kind of hold a wall in a gallery. So let's go back to it and sort of take 
speak apart and understand piece by piece what Faith Ringgold is doing with this really remarkable painting. So she is showing us a hundred different sets of eyes and noses. And it's a lot of those cold, hollow stares that she's been giving us through the course of this series. Um, and 90% of them are white. There's only 10 black faces in this whole picture. So that, uh, that sort of reflects the fact that there were, uh, uh, the, the Black population was about 10% of the population at this time. So, um, so it's this reminder, if you're Black and you're going through the world in, 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 in America, you were facing these kind of cold, dispassionate stares. So, um, so the Black uh, eyes, the Black faces create this diagonal going across the composition this way. And you'll notice that that is balanced out with the Black text here that spells out Black power. So those Black elements create this X across this postage stamp here. And um, to me, that reminded me right off the bat of the composition of the Confederate flag. This is uh, sort of like a, 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 a an innovative, um, take on, um, on, on a reverse Confederate flag in some ways. Um, the last time I gave this program, uh, someone mentioned really uh, wisely too that this could be a reference to Martin X as well. So there's other text embedded in this, of course, um, references to, to postage and the date. But I also want to draw your attention to the fact that she has also used white text here to spell out the words white power. Um, the, the text is pointing downwards this way. So we've got our, our black power, which is visible and, and it's, it's small in comparison to the rest of the composition, but the white power um, is, is subtle and perhaps more insidious in this case. Um, it's integrated into the work itself. I mean, you, there's so much to say about this. It's, it's a really smart piece. And, and I think there's a lot of works by Faith Ringgold that you'll see over the course of the next few, um, the next hours uh, that, um, will really kind of knock your socks off. So here she is in a recent photo in front of this work, but it was also featured in her first solo exhibition. We can just see the edge of it over here. And this is the artist herself. So, um, so really what's considered the culmination of this series is a massive painting. It's about 12 feet long and six feet high. And it's simply called Die. Now this work is really, hard to look at. Um, I remember I was working in an art museum in 2013 and we were um, going through some possible uh, um, exhibition uh, for the upcoming years and, and an exhibition featuring this work with, sort of came across our desk. And at that time, everybody around the table was just sort of like, this is, this is really tough content. And I, I'm not sure if our audiences for this museum are really ready for it. Uh, that was about 10 years ago. And I think the world has changed a lot since then. Uh, so what are we looking at here <laughs> in, in this picture called Die? We are looking at all of these bodies in sort of a splayed and agitated positions. Some of them are white, some of them are black, some of them are male, some of them are female. They're all dressed roughly the same, right? Um, but they are all engaged in some sort of act of violence or they're in the process of, of actually dying. So we see knives, we see guns, we see sort of like hand-to-hand -hand combat happening here. And it's all unfolding across this gray, um, monochromatic grid in the background, which Faith Ringgold said, that's the sidewalk. And, and the, it, the idea here is that there were um, racially, ins there was racially inspired violence happening all the time that wasn't reported in the news. And this was kind of her record of it. And it's this idea that, um, that people, that black and white people were vying for their position in society. And it was, it was a, it was a bloody contest. It was a it was a deadly contest, and so she made sure to include in this picture the innocents too, the white and the black child who are just holding each other, and they're terrified, and they don't they don't know to to dislike each other, or to hate each other here, um, because 
they haven't been taught that. So, so there's big lessons here, of course. Um, this was, uh, this is a part of the collection at MoMA. And uh, for some time, they were exhibiting it across from um, Picasso's famous 1937 painting Guernica, which is uh, sort of a response to Nazi bombing of this Spanish town. And he, it, Picasso famously captured the violence of that bombing campaign in these abstracted but really powerful forms. People, you know, dying and trapped in buildings and losing their children. And so it does seem like, um, once again, Faith Ringgold's work is kind of launching from where Picasso's work uh, finished up. So, uh, so this isn't necessarily the pinnacle of, of her painting. Oh, here she is uh, speaking in front of this work. This, once again, this is a photograph from 2013. Now, this this isn't the final work in, in the series, but we're going to end uh, our look at the American People series with this painting that's called The Flag is Bleeding. This is from 1967. And, um, and once again, Faith Ringgold is giving us a, a really tough scene of sort of blood and violence and this kind of amb ambiguous alliance slash hatred between white and black figures. We've got uh, a white man here dressed in a suit, uh, a white woman uh, dressed in sort of like a slip dress, like the figures in, in the previous picture, and a black man over here in what looks like a black turtleneck. And they're all linked arms. They're all kind of in it together. And they are, we have the, the American flag sort of overlaid um, or sort of as the backdrop here, but we can see that that the stripes of the flag are also going in front of them and they, they drape their hands over it as though it's like a fence or bars or something like that. And, and it's just dripping with blood. It, the, those red stripes are dripping with blood, going back to this notion that, that what was happening, the race riots, the violence on the street was a very bloody and hard affair. Now notice that the black figure here is holding a knife, which almost suggests that, you know, is he the cause of the violence here? You begin to wonder about it, but also notice that he has his hand over his heart. He, among all of these figures, is pledging allegiance to this flag, but, um, but he's also holding back a bleeding heart here. So it's, it's a very sort of interesting and powerful statement about, um, about patriotism and about what the true nature of, of American culture is. She creates a much more pointed and critical flag um, in the same year, which is called Flag for the Moon. Oh, sorry, this is from two years later, from 1969. It's in response to the moon landing. And of course, with the moon landing, we all have that famous, you know, video in our mind of the astronauts planting the American flag. Flag, uh, in the moonscape. And so you notice with uh, Faith Ringgold's flag for the moon, she has embedded the word die over the um, over the, the the blue and white stars here. And she has altered the stripes of the flag to spell out um, the N word. So, um, so combining those two words here is a very powerful criticism of what America is really about. And I think for her, seeing the flag on the moon was sort of like this extension of, of colonization and, and the extension of what was happening on the ground for her, the idea that it was going to continue on, uh, you know, uh, it, uh, in an interstellar way. And so she begins to, to really sink her teeth into this notion of, of the flag as a powerful um, mode for of uh, for expression and criticism, and so in um, in the following year, in 1970, she and a few um, fellow artists launch an exhibition that's called the People's Flag Show. This is sort of her flag slash advertisement for the show, and the text here is it's a little tough to read, so I'll try to take you through it kind of quickly. Um, the American people are the only people who can interpret the American flag, a flag which does not belong to the people um, to do with as they see fit, should be burned and forgotten. Artists, workers, students, women, third world peoples, are you oppressed? What does this flag mean to you? So the point of this exhibition was to, was to invite artists, and there was about 100 of them that participated, to use the flag as, um, as a means to, to sort of criticize um, 
uh, uh, the the American the American project at this point. So here she is with her fellow organizers. Incidentally, her mother designed this this dress and coat, and they were all uh, arrested for desecrating the the flag. They um, they I think they got out pretty quickly because the American Civil Liter Liberties uh, uh, Union jumped in on this one. But uh, but we see her call to activism at this point, and she begins to create a lot of work in response to what's happening in the world. World, and she's inspired by a certain type of, um, of composition here that came from these textile designs from, from the Congo. They're called uh, Kuba textile designs. And generally it's in like a square format that's divided up into these triangles. So we have um, woman freedom now and over here, woman free yourself. And we see Faith Ringgold with one of her daughters who becomes a preeminent uh, scholar. She's a, a PhD, she's an art critic, she's a feminist, and, and they, um, they kind of form this special alliance. And in the early 1970s, they, uh, they launch so many uh, 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 sort of activist groups to address the inequities that they saw going on. So this photograph that we see over here is a demonstration that took place, actually, I believe this was the late 1960s, in response to uh, a, a, an exhibition at the Whitney, a biennial, where they didn't feature any, I think they only featured two uh, uh, female artists in the entire show. And they thought, well, this is an outrage. And so Faith Ringgold recounts asking her daughter, how, how many women should there be in this show? And her daughter said 50%. So not only were they there um, advocating just for that, but they were they were leaving things like uh, hard boiled eggs around around the museum. They were using police whistles. They were, they were making themselves heard and seen. Um, Faith Ringgold also became really passionate about um, about people imprisoned in the U.S. and particularly after um, after the uprising at at the Attica prison, which she uh, like so many other people, you know, followed the story so closely and was just really appalled that these people who were um, protesting for for better, more humane conditions in a prison system were summarily killed by the state. So she created this poster called the United States of Attica from 1972. It was her most popular political uh, poster from that decade. And she outlines essentially in this or, or details in every state instances of political or state violence going back through the, the entire history of the country. And then at the bottom, this map of American violence is incomplete. Please write in whatever you find lacking. And once again, she and her daughter kind of took to the streets. They, they went to MoMA once uh, in this case, and with these signs that say impeach Rockefeller, the butcher of Attica. Rockefeller, who was the governor of New York City at the time, was also the president of the board of MoMA. So uh, Faith Ringgold would also lead these impromptu tours of the MoMA galleries, uh, you know, educating people on, on what was on view, and then sort of saying, well, this is where the market Martin Luther King wing dedicated to African-American artists and education should be. So, um, and I think it really flummoxed a lot of, of curators who were working there at the time. So we'll wrap up her, this section on paintings with just one last work related to, um, to people in prison. Faith Wrinkled uh, managed to get a grant for $3,000 to create a work of public art. And she wanted to create something for the women in prison on Rikers Island. So she went and she interviewed the prisoners, uh, talking, having conversations about what their life might like, what their lives might be like after prison, what they wanted, what they dreamed about, what they envisioned. And so she took what she learned from those interviews and she turned it into this incredible work of art that once again is inspired by that textile pattern from the Congo, uh, the square that's divided into the triangles here. And we can see um, we can see construction workers and police officers, basketball players. This is actually supposed to be the first female president over here. Um, this was created in 1971. We still haven't gotten that female president yet. Um, but but uh, it, this was you know a really sort of powerful work of art to to share with the women 
of, of Rikers Island. And so it was on view for decades. It was um, moved around some, and then it was actually on view in a section of the prison that um, housed male inmates. Uh, it, it was no longer a women's section. And the men actually whitewashed, I think the entire canvas and, uh, and it had to be completely restored. But here is a photo of the artist shortly after completing the work. So, um, so creating a large scale work like this inspired by textile designs with women as its subject and inspiration seems like a good transition to talking about Faith Ringgold's quilts. All right, so we have her here. We are unfortunately going to be sort of jumping over a lot of her work from the 1970s, which includes the soft sculptures that you see her surrounded by here. Um, she also made uh, masks and, per and did performance art in the masks. And all of this was um, in response, well, uh, uh, references and in response to what was happening in black culture, some of it inspired by, by African culture as well. But, um, but we're going to sort of transition past this and over to her quilts because, um, because her quilts are a little bit better known and, um, and I, I think are a favorite for so many people. So we see kind of the first instance of her integrating fabric with her paintings over here um, in a series from the early 1970s. This is called the, the Slave Rape Series. A lot of these works are very challenging. These are from 1972 and they are inspired by, this format is inspired by these works from, um, from I believe they were uh, Nepalese and Tibetan works that she saw while she was at the Rijks Museum in Amsterdam. And what she loved about them is that they had these fabric, they were paintings on fabric, but they had fabric frames to them, uh, quilt-like frames to them. And number one, this meant that she wouldn't need her husband anymore to take her works around to, to gallery owners and show people in person what she was capable of. This empowered her. And she really liked the fabrics. I mean, she grew up, you know, sitting at the table next to her mother, playing with fabric, stitching things together. And so this was another way to tell stories in paint. And the Slave Rape series is, uh, of course, a reference to uh, African women who were being captured into slavery. Um, the, the titles are, are really tough. It says, fear will make you weak, fight for your life and run and you might get away. And these three women are um, Faith Ringgold and her daughters here. So very powerful stuff. So she begins her first quilt with her mother and we see them working on it together here. This is a quilt called um, uh, Echoes of Harlem. And so it's, you know, there's something so wonderful about this that, you know, it's this kind of feminine tradition. It's like, you know, different generations teaching each other, which is how most quilts are made. There's like quilting communities where this knowledge is passed down from one generation to the next. And going back generations in Faith Ringgold's old family, there were quilters, including people who, um, people who were slaves who, who handed down this, this quilting knowledge. And historically, this is how women have gathered and, and shared information, not just about the quilting process, but about their lives. There's, you know, this is considered feminine work. It, it's also oftentimes relegated to like domestic work. And so quilts, generally speaking, are often not thought of as fine art. It's more like craft or folk art. But Faith Ringgold finds a way to kind of take something that was considered feminine and inferior and elevate it into a more masculine space like a, like a museum. So we'll talk a little bit about how she does that. Um, incidentally, this is that finished work called Echoes of Harlem. And this is, you know, it's a fantastic piece. And it's just so different from like, you know, the Black postage stamp commemorating Black power because, um, I mean, here we, it's, it's all black faces and there's character and vitality and, uh, and warmth to them. But I wanted to start off by talking about um, her story quilts, which are considered a major innovation, like her, one of her greatest contributions to the art world. This is probably how she's best known. And this is her 1983 quilt story quilt called Who's Afraid of Aunt Jemima, Aunt Jemima. Um, so this was something that she, this was the first quilt that she made after her mother had passed away. This was like the first thing that she'd made on her own. And in some ways you can sort of think of it as like 
a narrative loosely inspired by her mother, but also by herself. So she takes this, um, this archetypal sort of stereotypical figure of Aunt Jemima, who was uh, uh, in, uh, you know, born out of minstrel songs from the late 19th century, and of course used to sell a uh, pancake mix and takes this character and, and fleshes her out, makes her a real person unrelated to pancake mix, who has a life and a family and becomes an entrepreneur in her own right. So there's a lot here that ties into Faith Ringgold's own story, but it's not necessarily autobiographical. So she does, she creates images and she pairs it with um, extensive texts that she writes herself in this, um, in sort of like a, a, like almost like a black dialect. It would take a long time to go through all of these, but I wanted to share with you that, you know, it starts off with almost like a cover page, like a real book. And, um, and then each, each uh, panel of text is paired with an individual. And you can see here, she's even, you know, sewn in the beadwork on, on this particular character. So there's a lot of incredible detail here. So the storytelling is just as important as the quilt making and, and the detail work here. The next work that I wanted to show you is just from a few years later. This is in the collection of the Metropolitan Museum of Art, and it's called Street Story Quilt from 1985. Incidentally, this was um, purchased by the very first curator at the Metropolitan Museum of Art who came from African descent. Uh, it's kind of mind blowing that in the late 1980s, there had never been another curator for, of, of African descent. And, and she, uh, she has uh, the story that, that, uh, that these works were at the time categorized as being quilts and not paintings. And all of this was stored in cat card catalogs at the time, not in computers. So she had to do a, a lot of negotiating around that issue. So it's a story quilt about this one young man um, named AJ, I believe, and, and what was happening in his life in Harlem. So it's, um, it's his building in three different forms. This is like a triptych, three different uh, panels of the same size. And in the first panel, uh, AJ loses his mother in a car accident. You can see the cars down below and people, you know, people poking their heads out of their windows, uh, seeing what was happening. Then um, he loses his father in a fire. You can see the fire, uh, uh, the engine down here. And then all of this horrible stuff sort of happens to AJ, but ultimately he comes back triumphantly to his neighborhood. And one, it's so hard to see all the detail in this work, but here we see the artist with these works in recent years. And here's a close up just to give you a sense in terms of, of the text that she has written in and some of these incredible details. Hell no, we won't go. Uncle Sam, don't give a damn. Uh, a real sort of slice of life in, in Harlem. Um, the next work uh, it doesn't have that same kind of visual punch that we saw before, but it's her returning to the to the flag as a format for um, for criticism and in this case storytelling. So this is her flag story quilt from 1985. The um, the tie dye fabric here was created by the textile artist Marquetta Bell Johnson, and there's a really extensive story about a young man who goes to Vietnam, um, and he comes back a quadriplegic, and then he. He's accused of raping um, a, a white woman. So it's like these tragic stories about race and prejudice in, in the United States. But here, I think it's more, the visuals are much softer. Uh, maybe the story is a little bit more pointed. But as we get towards the end of the 1980s, her work begins to change a little bit. There's, there's less criticism um, and there's more, um, there's more sort of semi-autobiographical work and references to just African-American life life and women's experiences in particular. This is the Sleeping Lovers Quilt number two from 1986 over here. And we can still see it's a story quilt, um, but it doesn't have sort of that pointed commentary that we saw before. And this is simply called Double Dutch in the Golden Gate Bridge from 1988. And it's these children in, these ki in this kind of like ethereal sort of middle space here, uh, seemingly kind of floating above land, uh, 
playing uh, up against the backdrop of the Golden Gate. So, uh, so Faith Ringgold's life is changing. Her status in the art world has certainly changed. Here she is um, with Maya Angelou and Oprah Winfrey uh, celebrating Maya Angelou's 60th birthday in 1988. And at that event, Oprah Winfrey uh, commissions Faith Ringgold to create a quilt about Maya Angelou for her next birthday. And so here is the resulting quilt over here, um, which is now in the collection of the Crystal Bridges Museum. Uh, incidentally, if you follow Maya Angelou, you might know that she also played a quilt maker in a movie called um, How to Make an American Quilt. Here she is with her quilt behind her at home. And when, um, when Maya Angelou passed away in, I believe it was 2014, uh, this quilt was auctioned off and, um, and that's why it's now in the collection of the Crystal Bridges Museum, appropriate because Maya Angelou was from Arkansas. So um, you'll never believe how much these works sell for too. It kind of boggled my mind. This went for less than $500,000. It seems like a steal to me. So, uh, so her works sort of transition, like I said, by the end of the 1980s into more like celebrations of African-American culture, African-American life. She begins creating subjects, works on subjects that audiences can really connect with. This is called Who's Bad? And yes, it's about Michael Jackson and his dancing in his video from, uh, from the song Bad. Uh, the video is from uh, 1987. The quilt is from the following year. Who doesn't love a great pop culture reference? Don't you just love all these dancers in the background? Uh, Faith Ringgold has taken the violence that we saw before in the 1960s and has turned it into like these balletic moves behind Michael Jackson here. This is a celebration and certainly much more appealing to broad audiences. So that brings us to her best known work, which is called um, Tar Beach from 1991. It's a story quilt about um, these two children, uh, especially Cassie Lightfoot, who um, enjoy the summer air on the roof of their building in New York City. Their parents are playing cards and enjoying food over here. And she imagines that she's flying up in the air over the bridge here. And this, and this is based on her biography. She and her sister would do this. They'd call the roof of the building Tar Beach and and then the um the the quilt turned into a children's book and you can actually go on YouTube and hear watch Faith Ringgold read the story but this very complicated series which I'm going to have to go through really quickly because I realize we're short on time um from the early 1990s uh the one that I deeply appreciate because it's there's so many art historical references here are is called the French Collection and it's loosely inspired by this trip that she took with her daughters and her mother back in the 1960s, but it sort of, generally speaking, sort of reimagines uh, the story of early modern art. Uh, with this young uh, fe Black female protagonist involved. And in this case, it's called, uh, this first um, installation here is called Dancing at the Louvre from 1991. And it talks about how she goes to the Louvre with her friends and uh, with her friend and three daughters, and they're all dancing in the galleries and they sort of steal the show from Da Vinci and the Mona Lisa behind them. Uh, here, that same female protagonist uh, has the experience of modeling for Pablo Picasso, we see Demoiselle d'Avignon in the background here, and our protagonist begins to imagine, well, what if I became an artist? Um, what can I contribute really to the art world? And so Faith Ringgold uh, reimagines what early modernism looked like with this strong Black female character here. I apologize for the quality of the image over here, but this is called Giverny, where that same protagonist is now painting in Claude Monet's uh, water lily garden. And she is uh, accompanied by 10 um, celebrated American feminists. And in this case, she's got a male nude model. It's Pablo Picasso who's <laughs> sitting in the garden of Giverny. And, um, and she's clothed, he's naked, sort of uh, uh, flipping the whole story of, of Western art on uh, uh, upside down here. And so we'll just finish off with uh, two last quilts from this series very quickly. One inspired by um, Vincent van Gogh and his sunflowers in Arles. And, um, and these are leading women from the civil rights movement over here uh, with their own quilting bee. And this is a cafe scene. I just love this over here on 
the on, on the right, where we have leading figures from the Harlem Renaissance, along with some figures from uh, post-impressionism, including Gauguin and Van Gogh over here, and a self-portrait of the artist. So, uh, so really innovative works filled with references to other things that really just show how incredibly smart and well-educated um, Faith Ringgold is. So we will wrap up with, um, with her legacy and what her more recent works look like. Um, I, I sort of feel badly because I know so many museums have her work, but they don't have it out on view that often because it's fabric and it's light sensitive. And just by hanging it, it's like you're kind of destroying it. So I really love that, um, that her work was turned into mosaics at the 125th Street subway stop in New York City, in Harlem in particular. And so the, this is called um, Flying Home. And so she's created all of these images of, um, of, of prestigious uh, citizens from Harlem all over the years who are flying like her figure from, um, from her book uh, and from her, her, her quilt uh, about Cassie Lightfoot. And I just love the notion of flying home when you're you know, rushing off the subway too. And, and it's permanent and it's always on view. Uh, she, she has a, a number of contributions that become sort of permanent in the 1990s, including a foundation that she starts to advance the work of African-American artists. It's called the Anyone Can Fly Foundations, uh, no doubt inspired by, once again, Cassie Lightfoot from that Tar Beach quilt and story. She also publishes her autobiography, which is called We Flew, Flew Over the Bridge from 1995. So she's getting more established. Um, and and pr that's probably why she begins to dip her toe back into some more political works too. This is from 1991, I believe. And um, and it's, it's called We Came to America. And of course, it's uh, reimagining the Statue of Liberty as a Black woman holding a Black child. Her arm is sort of like a smokestack that leads our eye back to a burning slave ship. And we see all of these flailing Black bodies in New York Harbor, um, we and we understand them to be the bodies of slaves that have been um, uh, sort of thrown overboard out of this boat. It's uh, the, the composition reminds us of uh, of how hard it was to look at some of her earlier political works. Here, it's also references to paintings like the one at the MFA called "The Slave Ship" from 1840 that features um, the bodies of slaves in in the water, um, thrashing for their lives in a similar way. So, um, so much more pointed commentary. But uh, similar to her works from the 1960s, when there was a big event like 9/11, she used her art to respond to it. And in this case, the format of the American flag again. So it says on Tuesday morning, we faced the devil in the sky and told him that freedom will not die. So here she's, it's a statement of, of resilience and unity, uh, very different from how we saw her use the flag in the 1960s. But, um, but you know, people are ever, ever changing, ever evolving. Um, that doesn't mean that there, she still didn't use uh, her work to criticize America and its past. She does this whole um, printed uh, seriograph print collection that's called uh, Declaration of Freedom and Independence, sort of contrasting white and black experiences. Um, this one, this uh, particular page is called All Men Are Created Equal, uh, pointing out how white men uh, around the, the time of the founding of the country felt oppressed by um, the, the British king. But over here, a, oppression uh, on a slave ship certainly is much more brutal and inhumane. Uh, she contrasts, oh, and then down here, and women sort of in response to this notion, and all men are created equal. What about women? She contrasts um, Abigail Adams' uh, letters to very gentle, pressing letters to her husband, advocating for um, the the rights of women to be enshrined in the founding documents to uh, the writings of Sojourner Truth, who, who wrote about the same thing um, it, within a religious context. Uh, she contrasts the, uh, the Boston Massacre with the history of, of um, racial uh, lynching in, in the United States and uses this phrase absolute tyranny to kind of, uh, once again, throw into stark relief just how different absolute tyranny plays out in, in white experience versus black experience. And then finally, um, 
uh, here at the bottom, it says as free and independent states, um, this notion of, you know, Thomas Jefferson writing about freedom on a plantation that was uh, running on the backs of slaves versus Martin Luther King Jr. who was, you know, writing his, his uh, uh, letter from the Birmingham jail after being arrested for, you know, exercising his rights. Um, so, so these very powerful contrasts. Um, there's a couple things related to sculpture that I'm just going to skip really quickly, but I will stop and note that, um, that she was really interested in Barack Obama, proud of Barack Obama. She includes this portrait of him and the text born in the US Say, sort of going back to that um, that African textile composition once again and pushing back on the the birtherism um, that was coming out around this time that I believe this was 19 or uh, 2012 and I just want to sort of draw that line back to that work that she created inspired by her brother from 1964 about the um, the the young black man who sort of had everything going for him were it not for racism and prejudice working against him all those downward arrows you know and it really reminds me of um, of what what was kind of coming to the surface in her works about Barack Obama. She was ever inventive. She really liked the game Sudoku, and she invented a game herself called Quildoku. Um, same sort of reasoning in terms of uh, in logic puzzle, but in the end, you get like a faith wrinkled quilt <laughs> to celebrate with. And her works are being sort of reassessed and um and and appreciated in a whole new way so that that work that was damaged at rikers island has been um has been uh preserved and is now moving to the brooklyn museum she's thrilled about it because more people get to see it now um and the uh, that that really tough picture that we looked at the flag is bleeding it was just acquired by the national gallery of art just last fall and there is now going to be a retrospective of her work um, opening this month at the new museum in, in New York City. So it's like her hometown retrospective, a lot to celebrate there. So, um, so finally, people are getting comfortable with looking at these works. And I should mention many of her political paintings from the 1960s, nobody bought. They stayed in her collection, in her possession, and nobody looked at them for 40 years. And now people are starting to see just how powerful these images are, and that we as a country should probably sit with them, even though they're challenging and, uh, and provocative. So we will wrap up on Faith Ringgold um, and that, that portrait that we started with, uh, that self-portrait from 1965. We see her um, here in her apartment over here um, it, from 1968 in the photograph and then a more recent picture from, um, from 2013 where she was having a retrospective at the National uh, Museum of Women in the Art. So Faith Ringgold has had a, an incredible career. She's written, I think, 14 children's books. She's won more than 80 awards and I think has 23 honorary doctorates to her name. Her career has broken boundaries all along the way and she has pushed the status quo in the arts through her practice and advocated for the advancement and equality of women um, and free speech for her fellow artists. So she is a person who has spoken up, has told her story in so many beautiful ways over the years. And I think America and the art world are better for it. So I will end there for now. And I welcome any questions or comments anybody has about Faith Ringgold. So I'll just start going through some of these chats. Um, Oh, Marilyn, you asked something very early on and you said the figure, are the figures actual people of prominence? And I'm guessing you were asking about some of her paintings from the American People series. And these were uh, like fictitious people kind of based on her experiences. But if I'm wrong about what you were asking about, I apologize, we can get back to that. Are the faces in the first painted quilt on fabric? 
Um, if not, how are they done? Pat, I'm so glad you asked that question. I didn't make that clear enough. She was painting with acrylic paint on, on, on fabric and then using these pieced um, uh, fabric borders for them. That is a really important point that I did not hit on. So that was kind of a way for her to transform the whole um, quilting form in general. And so it, it's like she was creating almost like a new art form in doing that and really kind of pushing against this idea that that quilt it, quilting is craft and quilting is folk art. She's pushing it into fine art galleries by doing this. Um, the paintings with fabric frames, Catherine was asking, are similar to the art um, from, uh, uh, from Tibet. Asian scrolls, yes, um, are very similar, surrounded by fabric. In both examples, the, the first tactile experience is the beautiful fabric. Um, Catherine, that is a great association there. And I think um, it was Tibetan scrolls like this that, that were her first inspiration for that. So thank you for mentioning that. Elaine says, you've mentioned a few places, but is her work anywhere in Massachusetts or New England? Um, actually, the um, the quilt that she made in the French collection series, where um, where it is Pablo Picasso painting um, the protagonist here. This is actually in the Worcester Museum of Art. I've never seen it on view there. Once again, I think it's because of the delicacy of the materials, but I can imagine that the curators would really want something like this to come up soon. I know that my hometown museum, the Courier Museum, has a Faith Ringgold quilt as well. I don't think I've seen it on view for more than a decade now. So, um, so it, it's interesting. I, I wonder why they're not on view. And I always go back to this issue of preservation. I know that the, I think it was the Tar Beach quilt was donated mm -hmm. to the Guggenheim Museum. And as of 2016, it had never been exhibited. So I think it's just kind of a thorny issue for, for preservation or maybe curators don't know what to put next to it. That's a, that's a really legitimate question too. Um, Jan, I thank you for your kind, kind words here. And Elaine as well, I, that really means a lot to me. Thank you, thank you. And Barbara, Mary, thank you, everybody. Um, is the term Mr. Charlie a common expression for the power of white men? Um, Joyce asked, that's a good question, Joyce. I had never heard it before, but it's not like I'm necessarily the target demographic for, the, for people using that phrase. Um, I'm not sure if it's something that, that was more specific to the 1960s or if it's still used today, but if there's somebody um, online with us tonight who can speak to that, um, please jump in. Um, what about the faces in the later quilts like Van Gogh? So Pat, these are very, <laughs> these are very dense quilts. There's a lot happening with them. Um, she is referencing, you know, this entire art making history uh, in terms of early modernism and clearly uh, post-impressionism too. And, and it's, she, it's almost like with Aunt Jemima, with the Aunt Jemima quilt where it's like, there is, um, we, we understand the story of, of, of Aunt Jemima. And she kind of reinvents it by creating this strong black character that's loosely based on herself. And so she does the same thing with her protagonist in the French collection quilts. She has them engage, she has this woman engage with um, all of these great artists of early modernism, but suggests that this figure has a pivotal role as well. Um, so, and even suggests the possibilities of, you know, the fact that the, the contributions of women and black women in particular during this time period were, um, were not appreciated. So, um, so they're in there, they, and, and the, the references are, are um, there's so many of them and, and they're dense references. There's a lot going on with them. So I'm glad you asked that question. It would be a whole nother hour at least to go through through all of them. Um, let's just see. I meant how are the faces are created? Oh, thank you, Pat. Maybe we could go back to some of them. I believe these are all paintings on, um, on fabric, like um, like the, the story quilts that we've seen along the way. And I apologize once again that I really didn't make that that aspect of her of her process. Um, more, I, I didn't hit on it at all. So I really apologize about that. So as I understand it, these works are painted acrylic on, uh, on fabric. And let me just double check that in my notes just to see. 
in case, um, in this case, if that's any different. No, this is acrylic on canvas and these are pieced fabric borders. Um, a lot of these are in private collections. So many of them she still owns. It's really unbelievable. And I was just shocked that, that the Crystal Bridges Museum could get uh, one of her, um, one of her story quilts of Maya Angelou for less than half a million dollars. That just seems like a steal. So if you feel like um, Faith Ringgold is now one of your favorite artists too, let's get a bus trip going down to New York City so we can all go see that retrospective because the entire 12 uh, quilt series of the French collection will be together and on view. And I feel like that's gonna be really special because like I said, some of these are in a private collection. We wouldn't be able to see them otherwise. So, um, so I am so excited to go and see that. Let's see. Oh, Pamela, thank you so much for uh, sharing this. She says the courier exhibited the Ringgold quilt last year as part of the figurative exhibition. <laughs> Clearly I didn't get to that. Okay, so thank you for the correction there. Um, I hadn't seen it on view for so long. So I'm, I'm glad that it made an appearance. And that's another one where it's a story about women's lives. It's a really dense story. It's, and it's part of a series. So it's kind of hard to decipher on its own but the visuals of it are really gorgeous. So, um, so next time it's up, it's worth seeing again too. Um, <laughs> and Mary, I'm glad you're in for this bus trip too. <laughs> um, all right. So I think I got to most of these questions. If anything else pops up along the way, as always, feel free to get in touch with me through my website, which is I am culturally curious. Here we go. I am culturally curious.com. And, um, and if I wasn't clear on any part of this, I, I really appreciate you guys sort of pushing to know a little bit more about the process with the quilts. Um, or if you think I got something wrong, please let me know too. So thank you everybody for coming tonight. And, um, and I look forward to seeing you next month when we look at the work of Georgia O'Keeffe beyond the blossoms. That should be a lot of fun. So, uh, so take good care everybody and I'll see you very soon. Thank you so much.